everyone. It's Howard with the Seasoned Trucker. I'm actually at my son and daughter-in-law's house tonight down in Texas. And my daughter-in-law is gracious enough to sit down and talk to me about my granddaughter Eliana's <clears throat> battle with cancer for the last two and a half years. So without any further ado, let me introduce you to Alicia. Hello, Alicia. So Hi. nice to see you again, honey. Thank you. Been a long time. Yeah. And uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to move the camera really quick. Yeah. There's Eliana. Eliana, can you say hi? <laughs> <laughs> she is so precious. She's what now? Four? Four. Yeah. Four. Okay. Almost five. Almost five. Yeah. Five in August, huh? So I, so I remember the last time I was down here, she was, I don't think even two years old yet. Maybe a year and a half. Probably, yeah. Okay, so. You moved here about two and a, about one and a half. Like. So, so it's been over three years since I've seen her. <laughs> this little thing's been been through a lot, you guys. And um, Alicia is going to tell us in about a 10 or 15 minute video what has gone on in the last two and a half years. So um, let's go ahead and talk about that first time that she was diagnosed with AML. And could you explain to everyone what AML is, please? Um, AML is acute myeloid leukemia, and it's basically... It's basically your blood cells that just, your white blood count that basically mutates. Mutate, they don't really know why it mutates, but it mutates and it produces leukemia cells. And um, they mutate at a very fast, a very, very fast pace. And they eventually just take over the bone marrow, which is where all your white blood cells, your red blood cells, your hemoglobin, your platelets live and that's how your body functions and um it basically eats them up and lowers your platelets so you don't have that blood clotting mechanism and your hemoglobin which is where you get your energy and i give that's your blood flow you know it eats that up as well and just causes a whole auraria mess in your body and it makes your bone marrow not able to produce its blood cells on its own anymore it basically destroys the bone marrow. And if not, if you don't get rid of it, then it's just a, it's a harder road for sure. Okay, I just want to know your perspective on your journey this last two and a half years. I know that there were months on end that you spent in the hospital with Ellie. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. Five or six months at a time mm -hmm. over a span of, what, about a year and a half? Um, yeah, I mean, that first year, it was when she was first diagnosed, it was five months inpatient, minus we went home um, for two weeks uh, at two separate occasions, a week at a time in between rounds. Um, we got to go home the week of Halloween for the first time for a week, and then a week right before Christmas, um, but that was in a five, about a five month period and home for two weeks, um, just so she could have a little bit of normalcy um, before we started that, that third round of chemo and fourth round of chemo to get her back in remission and get rid of that cancer. Um, so that first year, yeah, it was five months and then we left the hospital in remission. Um, after you know some really trying days like uh chemo breaks the body down it breaks the good and the bad it um it kills the bad but it okay. also kills the good you know um, um chemo does just the unimaginable it breaks skin down and you know she ended up with a perineal abscess just a basically an abscess like on her bottom which ruptured and was open and and um, a really, really, really painful thing for anybody, no matter what age you are, to deal with. But at two, she dealt with it, and it was 
just a, a really hard thing for a parent to watch their kid go through, let alone the pain that she endured, that she didn't even, you know, for her, she just dealt with it because it was what she just had to go through, you know, each day. Um, so, um, but yeah, I mean, that's just, and, and in the midst of it, she, you know, because it, uh, chemo drops all of your counts, so it drops all of your blood counts and it, um, so that you can kill the leukemia. And when that happens, your, your immune system is lowered. Like you can end up with a fungal infection, which can be really deadly, um, really dangerous. And then you have to treat the fungal infection. You know, she ended up with a really yucky fungal infection after we had, I think, I think it was like 14 days with a fever. Um, and the fever wasn't going away. So they kept checking different things to see what it could be. And eventually we checked the nose and we found fungus up on the nose. And then she had to go down for surgery and have it removed, you know, a couple days in a row, go down to the OR and she had to be on this really yucky antifungal medicine that uh, the first time she took it, it caused an anaphylactic reaction and um, a really scary, really hard moment for a parent to walk with their child, like to see them go through what she went through. Um, but then we still, to get rid of the fungal infection, we still had to take that medicine, but bringing pre-meds on board where she had to take Tylenol and Benadryl and Pepsi to stop that reaction so that she could take it safely. And it just put her into a sweaty three hour sleep, you know, with all those meds mixed so that she could get that antifungal and get rid of that fungus infection. Um, but it, yeah, and there's many, yeah, there's um, lots of pieces that go into it. There's, um, you walk it with other parents, you, you have other parents that you meet and their kids are walking the drastic as well with different kinds of cancers. There's so many different kinds of cancers that you wouldn't even imagine that kids have to fight and they shouldn't have to fight it. Um, and um, so you get to know those families and you get to know those kids and you, and you get to walk with those parents through really hard days and you understand each other because you, you all walk that similar road and you know kind of what each of you are going through just a different journey um so it's a it's by any means not a easy walk um but also there's there's beauty within ashes you know there's things that there's joy that comes out of it you know when when she brings joy, she brought joy, joy to other kids and to, to nurses and to doctors and housekeepers. And um, when she was better, when she was feeling good, um, there's many, yeah, there's just many pieces to it that uh, is almost hard to like put in a nutshell of, you know. Well, Jason was telling me earlier, he and I were outside. Mm -hmm. Um, I asked him about the adjustment he had to make because he was basically, basically being a single father mm -hmm. to three boys yeah. for five months. Yeah. And he told me it was quite an adjustment. Yeah. And it had to be so hard on everyone, including the boys. Yeah, totally. Um, not having that mom love mm -hmm. because you you are a wonderful mother i i've known you for what forever yeah. <laughs> 15 16 yes. years yeah and, and you you're such an you're an incredible daughter-in-law um and eliana is just such an incredible granddaughter <laughs> oh she's shaking her head no but but she really is <laughs> Um, I know that she's a fighter. Um, she, she's got that will about her. Yeah. She really does. Um, tell us some of the, uh, uh, 
fun times that she actually had in the hospital by, by cheering the nurses up and, and some of the other young patients up and and, yeah. and, and, and just brightening their days a little bit. Yeah, for sure. She, um, you know, Eliana was very, like, when she got past that really sick point, once we got rid of that fungal infection and we got past those fevers, like, she, we would walk the halls. We'd walk the halls of the hospital. Like, we would go in visit the ladies at the blood bank through their little window and talk to them and that they always told me they're like it was the joy of their day because or the, their evening it was always at night when we went to stop to say hi but because they're like we don't you know we see kids names on their transfusion bags with their blood and their hemoglobin their hemoglobin and their platelets you know but we don't never put a face to the name like and it it meant a lot to them to see her every day. We kind of made a habit of it to go visit them every night, you know, just to talk to them for a little bit through their little glass window. And um, it was the highlight for them. And we would walk through the whole hospital, like, and say hi to people. And we'd see housekeepers. And <laughs> we'd come back on the hall and, you know, with her little baby doll stroller and her little squeaky shoes. And her nurses would come up to us and like, so-and-so wants to see Eliana, like, so-and-so, will you bring Eliana to so-and-so's room, like, and, um, you know, I, I had a nurse one time tell me, you know, she brings joy to, when she, when she walks in the room, she brings joy to a, to a hard place, um, and everybody knows her as her squeaky shoes, like, little Miss Squeaky Shoes, because she'd walk down the hall with her squeaky shoes on, you know, and, um, I had a mom stop me one time that we'd seen her several times, like just down on the on the picky floor. Um and she told me she's like, Your little girl brings me hope. Like she brings me joy. You know, to see her smiling and laughing and giggling, you know, um and we'd we'd go we'd be we were able to go visit other kids in their rooms on you know, on the on the cancer floor, like and go say at other kids and just love on them and laugh with them. And, but sometimes it wasn't always laughing because sometimes those kids weren't feeling good. It was a matter of just being in their presence and loving on them and saying hi to them and telling them and their parent that, Hey, we care and we love you guys. And it's sad that, that you've told me some of those young children have passed on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We, there's a handful of kids that we've, that we know that have, you know, passed, that we've met, that we spent time with in the hospital. And it's hard. It, and and also, also there's kids that, you know, have really came really, really close to that mark that have struggled with every journey they've walked. And, um, and now they're doing good. But then there's those kids that, um, that, that story doesn't look good. That diagnosis doesn't look good. That... Um, no. What the doctors Why say do you doesn't look good. You know, um, how they're reacting to chemo and treatment doesn't look good. I, um, we have a friend that they lost their little boy just a couple weeks ago to cancer after they fought for a couple of years and they had to lay him to rest. And that's, it's heart wrenching, you know, um, for a parent, for a family. Um, and then it, it, it changes so much. You have to get used to that life of, I don't have my child anymore. That I've well, raised. no one that has not been through this, there's no way that they can imagine. I can't imagine what you and Jason have been through. Okay. It's totally impossible. What I want you to tell the viewers is, um, Gosh, it just slipped my mind. What what would you like to tell viewers that possibly could go through this with their young children? What type of advice would you give them? Oh, um, I know that's a tough question. You know, there's lots of pieces that go into, but I think... Um, it's an unknown journey, like, and each day is different. It's, and for each kid, it's different. Like, each diagnosis is different. Mm -hmm. 
um, hold on to Jesus and, you know, as much as you can have that community to support you, um, trust, trust your, listen to your child, like be your kid's advocate, um, stay strong as a, and to hold together as a family as much as you can, because it's hard. And, and, you know, I know that yeah, being in the hospital is hard in and most of the time, like, and this I think is a big misconception for a lot of people, like, um, it's hard, like, when you're in the hospital with your child, like, and a lot of times it's mom, but also there's dads also, like, I'm, I normally have seen a lot of moms, but there's still those dads too that are just doing it as well, and then the mom comes to visit, you know, um, but it, it's hard on the whole family, it's, they walk it together. It takes a toll. Um, and the misconception is it's always the mom, you know? And, and yeah, like, you're in the thick of it, like, because you're there with every moment and every hard, hard thing your child has to walk, you know? But really, it's the family because at home, whatever the family's doing is the dad, the husband, like, in their head, they're like, what can I, what can I do? I can't be there. And especially when you throw COVID in there, which happened a second I time. was just going to br you know? bring that up. Uh, J Jason was telling me that uh, when COVID hit, it, it, I mean, the boys yeah. couldn't go up and see, see mm -hmm. their, uh, see their sister yeah. or their mom. Mm -hmm. um, and when he went up, you had to leave. Switch off. Yeah. And then when he, you came back up, he had to leave. Yeah. Yeah. That, that had to make it real special, extra hard. It, it it was yeah because you didn't couldn't have like you know we don't get to like we couldn't see each other husband and wife and so the only way we could see each other was in passing you know and we couldn't spend time together but then he got time with Eliana you know and I you know I left and just spent time with the boys whether it was going to get a smoothie down the road um, but it just it, it definitely it's not the same because like as a family, you need that time together to spend, to be able to support each other and love each other. And, you know, in like in your mind, when you walk it a second time, it, it's the worst feeling because you don't, the more times you walk it, the harder it is typically. And when she had to go through the bone marrow transplant, it was really, really, really hard. Um, and she walks some really hard roads and they tell you some really excruciating things you don't want to hear before transplant to prepare you. Um, because kids, some kids don't, some parents don't get to leave the hospital with their children. Um, it, cancer is, it's a monster, you know, and um, there can be complications and there can be ICU visits. And I'm so thankful that she never had to have any of those, like, um, but there's kids at home, like, and so not being able to do it together as a family, it's just so much harder. And, um, and the missing piece of the puzzle is like, you know, when Jason was at home with the boys, like we were missing mom and Ellie was missing dad and I was missing my husband and, and, um, you do the best that you can to, um, to walk through it, stay positive, and be as positive you, as you can. Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, for me, like, uh, for me, like, I know I had nurses in and out all day. So I mean, I seen people, I chatted with them, like, um, I seen doctors, like. But Jason, especially once COVID hit, like, nobody, Jason didn't see anybody. You know, it was lockdown. It was, um, you're at home, and he's trying to, you know, those dads at home trying to do it all and um that's an extra hard piece and so that that i and i say it again because i think that misconception is trying to be a single dad working from working home and trying to take care of your kids do finances cook clean laundry school, right. like doctor like everything that comes with it like that's what they become and so it's not just mom in the hospital because yeah it's hard don't get me wrong it's hard and um but it, it, it just, it's a whole, it affects the whole family, you know, in so many pieces. Um, and the siblings, because they're like, 
my mom, I need my mom, I need my sister, you know. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, I think that's another question. I think Jacob, Jordan, and Jameson are three phenomenal young guys. Yeah, they are, for sure. You know. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, and they take such, it seems to me they take good care of their little sister. Yeah, they do. They Especially Jameson. <laughs> You know, so is there anything else that you would like to say before we close out the video? Um, you know, it's a, yeah, you know, with pediatric cancer, like there's, it's, it's so sad. There's, you don't realize how many kids have to fight cancer. You really don't. I knew that there was pediatric cancer before our daughter had it, but I didn't realize how bad it was and how many kids actually have to fight it. Um, and it's not just that cute kid with a bald head, because yeah, they're cute with bald with their no hair on their head, but what they have to go through in the midst of it is really hard um, and it takes a toll. Um, but also there's like pediatric cancer, like there's 4% funding for that goes into like research and that, that there need to be much and, more funding yeah much much and more that and that doesn't look at like what these kids have to go through for side effects and reactions and what it does to their body in the midst of it and the fact that they break down their immune system so bad that they end up with a nasty infection you know um and someone's infection is worse than the cancer itself just trying to kill the cancer you know um so there's just there yeah i mean so just knowing, playing out there that we need more funding for, for these kids, for what they have to walk when they're diagnosed. Um, Cause it's just, it's, it's not fair. And there's so many kids that have to walk it and different cancers are different lengths of treatments. Like um, some kids get to, some kids it's a two, it's a two to three year treatment, but it's, you know, they'll have a week inpatient or a couple days inpatient or they get to do it in the clinic outpatient, you know, a couple of times a month. Um, but some kids take oral chemo, you know, every day at home, like, um, and it lasts a very long time. Um, and so it's just, and some kids might still be on chemo and still have a full head of hair on their head because they've grown it back after that, that intense stage. Um, so you just, you, you really, you never know, but so um, I guess just really fight for it, fight for it, and no like fight for funding because these kids should have better options for treatment. Now, is that four percent nationwide, or is that just four four percent here in Texas? It's four percent nationwide. Yeah. Wow. Um, and it's it's horrible. Like, and there's people that there's um, some yeah, there's some some parents that, and there's some young kids that like youth wise, like college age kids that go to the state like every so often and do like, uh, do like a, a, a big uh, presentation and tries to get funding and shares kids' stories and his family stories and all these kids that have in their wings and these kids that are still fighting. Um, and, but it's just not enough. And there's not enough funding. Um, the amount of chemo that these kids have to go through, it's not tailored for their body, for their little bodies um, to fight it. And it's just heart-wrenching. You know? um, I think Eliana has been through more in her short life than you, Jason, and I combined <laughs> in, yeah. in our entire lives. By far. She's, she's such a trooper. Yeah, she is, for sure. Yeah. Totally. So. It's huge. And, and, her, and another note, you know, I mean, when you have, for those people that have had cancer and had to have a bone marrow transplant, those people that have been the donors for those kids, they're a huge part of that. They're, they're like, her, Eliana's bro big brother is her donor. And, you know, he's our hero. He's her, here I call him, you know, her 
blood hero because you know she now houses bone marrow um but for those people that register for the national bone register bone marrow registry to be donors is huge because it might take a while to find a match you know um if they don't if that kid doesn't have a match in the family and sometimes there a lot of times there's but sometimes there's not and so you know register take get that easy swab to go register to be a donor and um, they can go to any hospital to, in the country to to do this yeah i mean and you can just it's just a packet that you send off in the mail for and they send you a packet with a swab that you swab your cheek with and you send it in the mail and then they go from there and they test it they test your cells on that and then if you're needed then they then you end up going into hospital and further further doing what they need to do for that next step if you're if you're like an actual match so um it's a it's a huge thing because you can never have enough too many people registered on there you know to save to possibly save a life right you know so yeah i mean there's kids i know of a family that had their son had AML and he had five, he did four or five bone marrow transplants. Um, and he, unfortunately, he passed after his last one, his last one in a birth. But, um, but yeah, so just register and be aware that there is, there's kids that fight cancer and it's hard. It's hard. Well, and it's let's hard. get this funding percentage up. I really need you folks to uh, really share this v video. Um, it might save a couple lives. It might save a, a million lives. Mm -hmm. We don't know that. Uh, Alicia, I want to thank you. I really, really do. And uh, I can't wait till we go out and what are we going to go do tomorrow? We're going to go play <laughs> putt, putt golf. Yeah. <laughs> thank you all for watching. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Appreciate it.